Going to the moon. My name is Jenny Fernandez and I'm a recovering addict. When I was 15, I started experimenting with drugs. Um, at first it was just all fun and games. Um, weed and alcohol were always the fun things to do at parties and then eventually um, it got a little bit heavier and harder. I started trying painkillers like opiates, um, which eventually led to trying heroin, which ultimately was my drug of choice. I eventually dropped out of high school and started hanging around with the wrong crowd. I was stealing. I ended up going to jail a couple times, um, disappointing my family left and right. But at the end of the day, I was so addicted to drugs and so caught up in that lifestyle that I didn't care who I was hurting or what I was doing to them. There's been times when I felt like I wasn't cut out to be a mom. Like maybe I wasn't doing the right thing. Maybe I didn't deserve my son. I even felt at one time I should give him up for adoption and let my mom keep him. I reached complete rock bottom in my life and I didn't see a way out. What really happened in my life was there was this little seed that was planted that kept telling me to change. And I don't know what it was in me that even gave me the motivation to wanna to do that, but I did and I checked myself into rehab. I was only there about a month and I didn't get anything. I was mainly like scratching the surface with the problems and with my drug issues and then I relapsed and I had setback after setback and then I finally got serious about it and went to rehab for the last time. I remember being in my room in rehab and I was detoxing so bad. I remember getting on my hands and knees and praying and I told God, I said, I need you to show up for me right now because if you don't, I can't do this alone. If I don't get out of this, then you can't hold it against me because I'm trying. I went to sleep that night and he gave me this vision. It was probably 10 years down the road from now and I was happy and I was with my son and I was getting him ready for school, but there was like this aura around me that it was like confirmation that it was God. It was, it was him showing me that I can have a future without drugs. It was him showing me that I was gonna be happy, that the depression was gonna go away, the guilt, the shame was gonna go away, that I could have a new life again. After rehab, I was in sober living and I just held on to that. As soon as I got the chance to leave and be out, I came to Elevate again and I gave my life to Christ again because all the times I've done it before it didn't mean anything. I was either doing it for my parents or doing it just because I thought that was the right thing to do. When I was at Elevate again, I remember there was a song during worship and they were talking about chains being broken and dry bones coming to life. I remember them saying, like, this is for somebody, this is for somebody, and they said addictions are being broken today. And I felt, I felt the Holy Spirit come into me. And it's not like, it was like never before, you know, like I've encountered God and I've had moments with him, but this was like nothing I've ever felt. Um, he comforted me and he told me that I was going to get through this, that he was going to be with me every step of the way, and he hasn't left my side. And now I am on the moon. I'm, I'm here serving, doing what God's calling me to do, being a testimony. I know there's things that happen and even being a Christian and being saved, life isn't going to be easy. There's times in life where it's hard depression it kicks in anxiety kicks in and you feel like your faith isn't good enough you feel like you are not good enough or you're not doing the right thing and I know firsthand because I was in the 
deepest, the deepest pit. Um, I felt like the gates of hell were all around me and I wasn't going to get out. I don't think, I don't think that I deserved the saving, but God came in and told me I did. He told me my life was worth living. He gave me a reason to live by giving me my son. And that's changed my life and I'm forever grateful for that. Sobriety seems so impossible for me, like something that was completely unattainable that I'd never accomplish. But on September 29th, I'm gonna have two years sober by the grace of God. And if there's anything you're struggling with, or if the moon seems too far away, just remember that with God, all things are possible. Come on, give God a big hand clap for being a saving, loving, delivering, life-changing God, amen? One more time, give God a big hand. Thank you, Lord. Listen, whether you're here or whether you're watching online right now, I love the words that she said. She said, God gave me a reason to live. And I believe that God is giving someone, whether you're sitting here in the audience, whether you're watching on live stream, he's giving us a reason to keep going, to not give up, to keep believing him no matter what you're facing, no matter what it looks like. God is real. He has a saving grace for every single one of us. Jenny experienced true salvation, and that is so amazing. Where's Jenny at? Are, are, you, are you serving? There's Jenny in the media booth. Come on, give her a big hand. <laughs> Keep it up, Jenny. We love you, girl. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And let me tell you something. Behind every great deliverance is not only our Lord and Savior, but, man, our wonderful people, and she was surrounded in the right place. But let me tell you, I have to say, their parents went through hell and back. I saw them go through all of it. And prayer after prayer, tear after tear, brokenness after brokenness. Is Denise and Mike in this service at all? Are you guys in this service? Okay, there's Mike and there's Denise. Why don't you guys stand up? Denise, stand up. Because let me tell you something. As a parent, to see your child, and then Mike is over there in the back. Thank you so much for, for pressing through and, and, and modeling what really is faith and so god bless you both honestly because that ain't easy just as a parent just to think there was t times where we talk and be like i don't know i haven't we don't even know where our daughter is it's been days weeks not know, knowing whether she was dead or alive but but god amen but god but god you know as i was preparing for the and this message is hot off the press let me tell you because it's been a busy week just got back from mexico and uh and so i was like okay god how do we finish this bad boy what do we say? And being with all these different people, we spoke at the Senate, which was pretty awesome. On that day of the Senate, they also did, I forgot to mention it, but they, they signed a, uh, uh, a new law to now start convicting any, uh, any person in Mexico that does any form of child pornography. It was literally signed on that day when Carol and Virginia, my wife, spoke and it was the most, I'm telling you, that's a big victory. Because prior to that day, that law did not exist. So it was an executive order that day. And uh, God is good. I'll tell you, that's going to the moon. That's definitely going to the moon. So I started thinking about the children of Israel. And when you think about the children of Israel, you think, okay, they're God's children. So if they're God's children, then why were they enslaved? Why were they captive for 400 years? Have you ever asked yourself that question? You, like, God, why would you allow, if they're your kids, why would you allow them for 400 years to be captive and to be enslaved by the Egyptians? Like, God, what's up with that? And if you don't ask yourself those kind of questions, then I don't know what's wrong with you because that may be normal to you. I don't know. And I can only think about this because think about this, 400 years. Now, when you take the number 400 years, in our generation, we think 100 years is a generation. So we think in our minds, well, that's four generations. But if you really look at the text or if you study the word of God, you realize that in biblical terms, when we talk about generations, generations were made up of 40 years. So just think, you divide 40 by 
430 actual years of them being enslaved and being taken captive by the Egyptians, that's 10 generations. So just think this. If they were the children of God, they were the children of God, but not really. They were the children of God, but not really. Why? Because here's what happened. Within those 10 generations, they started losing the essence and the salvation of God generation after generation after generation where all of a sudden all they had was a memory of God. That applies to so many of us. We've been saved for maybe a few months, a few years, maybe many years, and you can have this generation of being a Christian, but it's so easy to be sitting in these chairs today, like every single church around the world, especially America, and know and understand what salvation is, know about God, but not really experience the personal, intimate relationship of your living God. Amen? And then now you're just living on memories. Everything's just a memory. You have a memory of when God healed you. You have a memory of when God saved you. You have a memory of when God delivered you. You have a memory when God did a miracle. But let's take now a few years, you know, ahead, and it's almost like all you have is memories, and you have nothing fresh and new to say about your God. So just think about this. So for for 10 generations, they literally took God out of their belief. But here's what's interesting, because when you study that book of Exodus and you study the whole story of the children of Israel, we know that there was a moment on 430th year where they cried out to God, the Bible says. Remember that? It says, and they cried out to the Lord. Why? Somebody had a little bit of faith. Somebody had a little bit of juice still left in that salvation. Somebody had a little memory of God's grace and God's mercy. And the the Bible says, and the people of God, and they cried out to God. And it says, and then God raised up a man. See, I believe that there are people right now around this world that are crying out, and you and I are the response to that prayer. And they cried out to God, and God raised up a man who was in the desert, in the wilderness, who was doing a whole lot of nothing for 40 years, raised him up, sent him to to Egypt to speak to Pharaoh. And what did Moses tell Pharaoh? Let's see how good you are with your Bible knowledge. He said, good job. And, 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 And we know how the whole story, and I'm not here to preach on that, but I just want to kind of give you guys some context here and some foundation. And so now the people are, they're in the wilderness because Moses said, he told Pharaoh, God wants his people to worship him in the wilderness. And so now they're in the wilderness. How do we know that they took God out of their belief? Here's where we prove it. When they were in the wilderness, when they were in the wilderness trying to get uh, to the other side of the Jordan, here's what happens. Moses says, let's build God an altar. You know what they ended up building? They ended up building an image of God that the Egyptians had created in their time. So that tells you that whatever you hang with, whoever you hang with, affects who you are. Their image of God was an Egyptian God. That that reflects us because sometimes we can know about God. But there can be this, this, this almost like this, this battle and this struggle within your soul where you still have a little foot in the world where you let the, the spirit of this world begin to give you an image, but then you still come to church periodically, and then you have a whole other you know, world where God's trying to reach you, but you're torn between two worlds, and you don't understand your salvation. And so you, you constantly come to a place like, man, why can't I get healed? Why can't I get delivered? Why can't my family change? Why are my kids crazy? Why are we walking away from God? And if you think about it, well, for generations, all they had was a memory of God because they took God out of their belief system. But here's what I, as I read, I'm like, but I thank God. Man, God, you are so merciful because what little bit of faith they had left, 
they cried out to God, and no matter how little that cry was, God responded to them in their struggle. God responded to them in their brokenness. God responded to them when they wanted nothing to do with God. Aren't you glad that we have a God that even if you're at your lowest point, like Jenny was at her lowest point, she said, man, God, if, if I don't get out of this, well, it's on you now because I've tried everything, that God will respond to you even at your smallest little faith in life. Give God a big hand clap for that. <laughs> little bit is much when God is in it. Don't you ever forget that. Just a little bit is much with God. Just a little bit of faith. Just a little bit of trust. Because maybe you're sitting here today and you're facing some major challenges. You're facing some stuff that looks impossible. But if you just have a little bit, that's all God needs. It's just a little cry and God will save you. God will heal you. God will restore you. And that's what he wants to do in our life today. And one thing I love about Jenny is, you know, after she went to rehab, then she went to the sober living home. But one thing that, that because you, know you know what the hardest part of, of seeing your miracle, your breakthrough, whatever it is you're believing God for, you know what sucks? Is the process. The process sucks. Why? Because, you know what, you look at the moon when you walk out at night, you're like, dang, how do we get up there? Don't you think she had moments like that in the sober living? Moments in the process where she probably felt like, man, that struggle, that battle within the soul. Come on, the devil wanting to come in and start confusing. The devil wanting to come in again and start tricking. The devil wanting to come in and start bringing people around you, right, that will try to pull you back into that lifestyle. Come on, this, this stuff is real. But while she was in her process, you know what Jenny did every single weekend? And Jenny, I never forget that. Every weekend, she would come in anywhere between one to four girls from that sober living home. And they would come here, and after every single service, every single Sunday, she would introduce me to every single girl that was also in the process or in the hallway of their healing. And every single one of them came to Christ every single Sunday and were rocked by God. And, you know, of course, I don't know where those girls are today. Maybe some still come here. I don't know. But let me tell you something. Regardless, I'm going to know that when God's word is deposited in your heart, it is a seed, and that seed will come up, and it will be a great harvest. So don't ever despise those small little beginnings because God will use it. He'll use it for his glory. And so... Uh, I want you to write this, or you can look on the screen, because there is a capacity to perceive unseen things when you become born again. I want to talk about your salvation today, guys, because I think that it's great success. It's great to have, you know, financial increase. But I believe in all those things. We teach that here. But, but if your soul is jacked up, huh? But if, if we're willing to lose our very own soul to gain the whole world... <laughs> then it's empty. There, there's, no, there's no joy. There, there, there's no healing. There's no deliverance. And so there is a capacity to perceive. Everybody say perceive. Because right now in this room right now, you all perceive God in a different view. And my, my, my goal, my heart today is that we all perceive God the same way. And so we all have the capacity to perceive unseen things because the bible says we walk by faith and not by sight so god wants us to stop looking by sight and start looking by faith so that we can begin to see the unseen things but that only happens when you're born again and then you'll begin to see some things i'll prove it to you now scripturally here's what jesus said in john chapter 3 put that up guys john chapter 3 verse 3 it says jesus answered him so there was a guy who was having an issue with salvation can change how many know that you can be saved and still have an issue with changing you can be sitting in here and be a faithful christian but be struggling on the inside just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're really saved saved because there's some people that are saved but living like hell how many would agree with that right we see it all the time we've all been there but Jesus answered him, and he says, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, unless, if a person is born again, reborn from above, 
spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, or set apart, he or she cannot ever see and experience the kingdom of God. But have you noticed that as people, our nature is to focus on, on, on things from the earth. In other words, we, we, we tend to focus on, okay, let me reinvent myself. You know, let me, let me start making some, some physical changes. Let me exercise just a little bit. We're always thinking on the outward appearance on this earth. But notice that, that Jesus said, hey, listen, if you're ever going to have a metamorphosis change, if you're ever going to be like a wonderful, beautiful butterfly, then you're going to have to be developed in the cocoon of my salvation. And it's that metamorphosis that brings spiritual transformation, but it comes from above. But we tend to focus on things on this earth. Well, when she changes, I'll change. Well, when he changes, then I'll change. Well, when my job changes, I'll change. And we're waiting for everything on the extremities to change so that then we can be renewed. But here Jesus said, hey, listen, if you're going to have an everlasting change, that change comes from above. If you're going to be renewed, sanctified, if you're going to be spiritually transformed, you got to look up. Because when it comes from up, it'll hit your down. It'll hit on earth. That's why he says, you know, when we say that prayer, we say, Father, we ask that, that, that you would bless us. What you, what you do in the kingdom, Father, let it impact the earth. That's what we're saying here today. And so one thing I noticed about uh, what uh, Jenny said is she said this. This wasn't real to me in, 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 in a certain way. She was basically saying, uh, this salvation really didn't have much meaning to me. Why? Because she was doing it for all the wrong reasons. And I think sometimes there's people even here, like maybe some husbands. Like the only reason you go to church is because your wife is saved. Nothing wrong with that. I applaud you for that. You know, there's people here that uh, only believe God because their grandmother, their grandfather prayed for them. You know, or there's kids here, young people. I loved it at the 8 a.m. This is young people get come, come into Christ. Why? Because they realize that, you know what? I don't have my own salvation. I have the salvation of other people. I, I, I'm trying to please mom. I'm trying to please dad. I'm trying to please family. But I have never seen or experienced the true kingdom of God. Me personally, that I've encountered God for myself. I'm, I'm tired. You got to come to the place where you got to be sick about hearing about other people's miracles and you need to start experiencing some of your own. You need to stop hearing about other people's breakthroughs and you need to come to the place where you say, I want to get, I want to encounter, I want to experience God's kingdom in my life. I want to see some personal breakthroughs where when people ask me, how did you change? I can personally say, Jesus did. Because it means something to me. It's real to me. Jesus should be more real than the very chair you're sitting on right now. Much more real. But that's the struggle, isn't it? That's the battle. And that happens to Christians that love God, but it also happens to Christians that are far away from God, and it also happens to people that don't know God. It happens to all of us. I am preaching to the choir today. We all come to this place where we literally lose sight, lose understanding. Our faith gets diluted, right? And most often our faith gets diluted by the people that we hang with will always affect us. And then instead of building some God worship you know, moments, we start creating idols. Are you here today? I know this is, this is a real easy sermon. I ain't trying to be deep. I ain't trying to give anybody floaties today. You know what I'm saying? I want us to be above and not beneath. Kingdom of God. Say that with me. Kingdom of God. Because he said you'll never, ever experience the kingdom of God. You'll never experience it and you'll never see it until you're renewed, transformed, sanctified, and that only comes through Jesus. Okay, well, what, what is kingdom of God? Because I know that a lot of Christians are always like, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, but don't even know what the heck kingdom of God means. Like, what does the kingdom of God mean? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at this definition. Kingdom of God is simply this, God's rule over all. Does God rule over all of your life or a part of your life? Okay, some people say part. That's cool. You're being honest in church. I love it. We're vulnerable. We're going to call ourselves Elevate Vulnerability Church. God's rule over all in heaven and where else? And on earth, including who? Satan's defeat. 
That means that when you experience the kingdom of God, that means that you not only experience God in heaven and on earth, but you will also experience the defeat of Satan's works over your life. See, if, if we're going to receive true healing, restoration from depression, anxiety, and all these things and sicknesses and diseases, we need to learn how to experience God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. Because how many know that Satan also has a kingdom? He's the king, his kingdom is, is he comes to steal, kill, destroy. God's kingdom, Jesus said it very simple. His definition was, but I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. And so when we're talking about experiencing the kingdom, it, it comes to a place of just saying, God, I need you. I, I need to focus on things from above. I need to focus on my salvation because outside of that salvation, I will stay in bondage. I will be enslaved for the rest of my life with wrong thinking, wrong living, wrong everything. And he's the only one that can save me. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. In other words, Matthew 6, says this, but seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, seek first the salvation of God first. Then all these things, all these things you're believing for, whatever it is you need, he says, I'll add them to you. But we always want it the other way around. We want it, uh, give us all these things, and then I will seek you, God. Huh? He says, no, but first. Everybody say, but first. first. Look at your number say, the first thing, the first thing. is the first thing. Seek God. I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me. But first, seek God. That's what you did today. Before you went to go to the beach or wherever you guys go, you came to see God. And then all these things will be added for you. Seek first the salvation of God and these things, healing, restoration, your family, whatever. See, we're always trying to save everyone else while we're losing ourselves, God says, no, let's save you first, and then we can save everybody else. That's the kingdom of God. And so here you have Jenny. She, she experienced finally, it was no longer your faith, Denise. It was no longer Mike's faith. She was done getting the approval of everybody, and she said, no, I'm ready to seek the living God, and that's when things changed. That's when things change. Are you guys here today? If you're born again and you're transformed by the living God, then here's what happens. Then we have the capacity to see the unseen and the impossible take place in our life. I'm telling you. He said, call those things that are not as though they were. It's the, it's, we have the, the, the uh, unrestricted ability to tap into the unseen when you're born again unrestricted unlimited you know what our problem is we defend our ideas and when you defend your ideas that's why God says my ways are higher than your ways my thoughts are higher than your thoughts You know what we do? We want to bring God into our ways, and we want to bring God into our thoughts, and then we think that we're going to work everything out, and God's like, hey, sorry, don't think like you. Don't live like you. Don't do like you. Don't do anything. And so God's saying, no, come back to my salvation. Come back to my truth, and then that's when we begin to see the, the most. Think about this. Like, I want to ask you something. Like, what are some things that you keep saying, I can't? I can't. Like, you tell me about human traffic in Mexico and the natural? I can. Can't. It's so hard. Can't do it. Like, even being there, I get a headache. Because I'm. you see all these kids everywhere, and you're just like, God, I I. I can't, I can't, I can't see it. That's the truth. It looks impossible. 70,000 people being human trafficked just in Mexico City. That's just the city. I wonder what the whole nation's like. There are towns where they're raising up children to be pimps. 
You ask the little kids, they've been interviewed. They ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? They said, I can't wait to grow up and have my own slaves. And parents are raising them up generation through generation through generation. It's a curse until the church rises up and says, it's going to end here. It's going to stop now. Now, you don't have to go to Mexico, but we can all be partners with God. We can all partner with God's vision. We can all partner with prayer. We can all partner by fasting. And we can start saying, Lord, bring your kingdom that's in heaven here on earth. And let's see some renewal and change. You can do the same thing for your house. You walk in your house, say, Lord, man, there's always chaos in here, kids yelling, everyone going wild, everybody in division. Lord, I pray your kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God is just waiting for his people to say, kingdom come, salvation come. That's what we're praying in Mexico, salvation come. That's one thing I respect about Zoe is that it's always centered around Jesus. Nothing orbits around anything but Jesus. At Elevate Church, nothing orbits around but Jesus. He's the centerpiece of Elevate Church. Amen? Amen. That's who he is. But what are you saying? Come on, I think that we're more convinced of what we can see instead of unrestricted faith. <sighs> okay, let's look at this. Perceive. Let me give you, ever say Perceive. Okay, so check this out. The word perceive, because we're all perceiving a little different today, but we're all going to leave here perceiving the same way. Perceive means this. When we perceive something, we become aware of or notice it. In other words, when you came into this church, you either perceive that God's presence is in this house or you didn't. You perceive. It's okay, Alexis. We're not ready, babe. And sometimes we perceive things by using our senses of sight. This is what the word perceive means. Perce- uh, uh, perceive things by the using the senses of sight the hearing and smell and that's all scriptural because when you think about it you know it we walk by faith not by sight so there's that it says hearing faith comes by hearing romans 10 17 faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god right so hearing but it also says smell so we all perceive like there's an aroma to heaven how many know that like there's an aroma to your house and there's either there's either a heaven aroma or a whole lot of other aromas that's why the Bible says this. He says, when you pray to me, it comes up before me like a sweet-smelling aroma. When we worship today, when we sang songs, hopefully you perceive that you're not singing your jam, but you're singing to Almighty God. Amen? Amen. Amen. When we're singing at the cross, oh, I love that jam. Man, I'm singing, I'm telling him, thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for the cross. Thank you for saving me. I didn't deserve it, but you still saved me. Amen. Do you perceive that? Or is it just walking here like, oh, I hate that song. Huh? Oh, why are they doing that song again? Oh, my God. You know, and, or, just, <laughs> you know, or just looking around. Yeah. L- listen, no, 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 no. No, see, you either, came, you either came to seek God or you came to seek man. Which one? See, that's the kingdom of the world, and then there's the kingdom of God. That's just the way it is. So when we come in this place, man, we give a, we give a shout to God because we perceive that he's in this house. Do you perceive that he's here right here right now? Do you perceive that he, listen, one word from heaven and he can shift literally your life. Shift it. One moment with God. Jenny said, I came to one service and I remember that service, Jenny. I remember it. I remember that night. It was an elevate night and we were worshiping. And I remember God telling me, there's one person here that's about to have addictions broken. I remember it clearly. Do you realize that one word, one word, not one word from Mauricio, one word from heaven, when you perceive that there's something from heaven for you and you grab that word, let me tell you something, it'll change your life. She said it was that night that I received my salvation. That one word. God is breaking addictions. God is destroying it. See, you either perceive that's God or that's just another service, praise God. Seriously. You get what you put in. Put your heart in God and see what he does. Perceive. Okay, let's keep reading. We're almost done. Or we can use our mind. Everybody say mind. 
Come on, because even our mind plays tricks on us. To perceive things, which means that we are able to recognize or understand them. I, I've learned something. I have learned in my life. Well, let's just do this. Everybody close your eyes. Everybody, everybody, everybody close your eyes. If your eyes are open, I'm going to poke your eye. <laughs> close your eyes. Listen to my instruction. Please listen to my instruction. Please, I beg you. Just do this favor for me. I want you to see yourself dressed in an astronaut suit right now. Astronaut suit. Right now. You're in your astronaut suit. Okay. Now that you're in your astronaut suit, I want you to envision you walking on the platform that goes from one building to into the space shuttle and i want you to walk into the space shuttle now please listen i'm almost done walk into the space shuttle and i want you to pick the seat that you want to sit on and if there's the joystick i would go sit in that one okay okay i want you to look at the people around you and stare at them Now stop. Look at me. How many saw themselves the way I described it? Lift your hand high in here. Hi, everybody. Please, quick. I have a point to make. How many were wearing, hands down, how many were wearing a white suit? Lift your hand if you're a white suit. Look at Okay. Put your hands up. How many were wearing a blue suit? One person was wearing a blue suit. Who was wearing an orange suit? Any orange? Okay, see? Listen. Here's my point. Okay. I want you to think this. When your eyes are open, it's easily to get distracted with envisioning what God wants for you. So I have learned that when I close my eyes, I can no longer be distracted by the things of this world that tell me you can never be that, you can never do that, and you can never change. You can't be. I've learned this. Close your eyes. And you're less distracted. That's why he says, walk by faith, not by what you see. What do we do? We see and we say, I'll never change. I'll never have that business. I'll always make this dollar amount. I'll never have a house. I could never have that. My, my children are never going to change. Yeah, you're, you know what? And most often you're right because that's how you see. But notice everyone here perceived, most of you perceived white space suit. Another person perceived a blue suit. Another per person of peoples, like seven or eight people, said orange suit. See, God wants you to dream, but you got to perceive. Yeah. You come on up, babe. That's my daughter. I can call her babe. <laughs> so we're like, oh, that's weird. It's my baby. Second Kings, I'm already ending with this quickly. Do you guys get this? Yeah. Okay, Second Kings 4, 8, 17. I'm almost done. Stay in. Stay locked in, okay? Pay attention. Just do it with your eyes open. One day Elisha went to the town, because I want to give you the example now biblically. One day Elisha went to the town of, uh, of Shunem. And a rich woman lived there, and she begged him to stay and have a meal. So every time, this is Elisha, and every time um, that he came by, he stopped there to eat. And the woman said to her husband, that man often comes by here. I perceive, everybody say perceive, perceive. that he's a holy man of God. Let's make a small room for him on the roof. We'll put a bed and a table in it. We'll also put a chair and a lamp in it. Then he can stay there when he comes to visit us. And then one, one day Elisha came. And he went up to his room and he laid down there. And he said to his servant Gehazi, go and get that woman from Shunem. So he did. And she stood in front of Elisha. And he said to Gehazi, tell her, you have gone to a lot of trouble for us. Now, what can we do for you? Let's just stop right there. You have gone into a lot of trouble for us. Now, what can we do for you? 
Let me ask you this question. What are you doing for God? Where he'll come back and say, now what can I do for you? Stay there. Because a lot of us are expecting God to do everything while we're doing nothing. So the man of God recognized, perceived, this woman, she's a doer. She doesn't just sit around. She loves God. And, and her actions show that she loves God's word. Let's keep going. Almost done. Now, what can we do for you? Can we speak to the king for you? Or can we speak to the commander of the army for you? She replied, I live among my own people. I have everything here that I need. After she left, Elisha asked Gehazi, man, what can we do for her? Man, this girl's just amazing. This woman's like awesome. Dot com. Gehazi said, hmm, she didn't have a son. She didn't have a child. And her husband is old. That brother can't produce or reproduce. <laughs> like, man, you look at him. And he's like, Elijah, just calm down, relax, dude. Okay, old, I got it. <laughs> he's old. Then Elisha said, bring her here again. So he did. She stood in the doorway. Everybody say doorway. And he says to her, you will hold a son in your arms, Elisha said. It will be about this time next year. Say about this time next year. She said, no, my master. Don't be playing, man. Don't be pulling my leg. Don't be lying, man of God. So please don't lie to me. But the woman became pregnant. She had a boy, just like the prophet said. And it happened the next year. When did it happen? Next year. When did it happen? Next year. Where did it start? At the doorway. That's exactly what Elisha had told her would happen. Let's paint the picture now. So she's, she's accepted where she came from, the past. Never had babies. Couldn't have babies. Couldn't do it. Like some of us. Some of us have a past of pain, suffering, some very challenging, traumatic things that took place in our lives. Just some things that just like, it's hard to let go of that past experience, whether you lost a business, whether you, you got divorced, whether a, a child died. Something. We all come from something. And she, she accepted that. But now she, she's been just kind of like, okay, well, I've, that's why she said, don't you lie to me. Because I've already, I've, I've learned to coexist with my reality. I'll never have child. So don't, met, don't even begin to give me hope. I left that season. And I just accepted, this is who I am. This is our lot of life. I'm good. So don't lie to me, master, no. He said, girl, no. I'm bringing you a word from heaven. See, because God's word will always trump your ideology. God's word will always trump what you think can't happen, what you think won't happen. God's word will trump whatever looks impossible to you in the natural right now. As I was just reading this, I remembered. I remember being in this place of pain years ago. I was supposed to have a 14-hour surgery, which I did. And this room, my hospital room, was the room of pain, a lot of pain, suffering, sickness, disease, bad report after bad report after bad report. It was horrendous. It, was, it, it affected my family, my children. I questioned a lot, am I going to live or am I going to die? It was a really bad situation. And I remember being in my room. It's 30 days of just sickness. Then I was on an oxygen mask. Then I was on machines. Then I had over 100 needles put through my arms so bad that my whole arm was black, just purple. They couldn't find any more veins in my, in my arms because I had just so many needles going through me over. It's just, ah. But I'll never forget, I was there going through my suffering, but I had Jesus with me. I had God with me. And, and then, and then, one little word, one little word came from the doctor. They said, well, there's only one thing we can do. I said, what is it? They said, well, we can give you surgery, 
but you have a 50% chance of dying on this table today. But you're, it's, a, it's a 50. And so my mom thinking, man, I could put my faith on that little 50. See, it's not about how big my faith is. It's that God can do much with little. And I cried out to God, God, if, if you save me, I'll do anything. That's how Elevate Church was birthed years later. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted to be in business. I wanted to be in missions. That was my heart. Fund the kingdom of God with a whole lot of money. That was my dream. But how many know that sometimes your dream needs to die in order for God's dream to live? And I'm right there. I said, okay. And, and so I remember when they prepped me, I felt like Jesus for a minute because they make you shave all the hair off your body. But then I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm about to go into the tomb. I did. I was like, I felt like, what the? This is weird. And I was prepared. And I'll never forget, they, they rolled me out of finally the room. I was in critical care, intensive care. They rolled me out and they brought me through this hallway. And I'll never forget the hallway because the hallway felt like eternity. Like just like, you know how hospitals are, right? Just all white and then white ceilings, right? Just, just, just like, doo-doo. Doo-doo. I was just like, hey, we're almost there. Are we there yet? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like, and I'm going through this hallway forever. But I'm contemplating, I'm between two places. I'm between the place of pain, but I'm also in between the place of over here, the possibility, the surgery room, 14 hours. Right before I got to the room, in my head, see, a lot of us right now, you may no longer be in that room of pain because you've accepted the process is the hallway because it feels forever. Is it ever going to happen? Am I ever going to get healed? Am I going to come out of this? Am I going to live or am I going to die? Am I going to be depressed for the rest of my life? Am I going to live in anxiety? Am I going to kill myself one day? And we start going through these thoughts. These were the thoughts I was going through. God, uh, you know, I know I'm, if I die, we win, God. I kept telling God that I would never I would never speak those words to my family. I always kept telling them, I'm going to live and not die. I was trying to be strong in their presence. But along with God, I was vulnerable. Because I said, God, what if I die? Then at least we win. The devil doesn't win. I win. I get to be with you forever. But it's not what I want. I want to fulfill your purpose. I want to see my kids. I want to see them get married. I want to see them fulfill their call. I want to see them. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. And I finally make it there. And now I'm at the doorway, the doorway of the surgery room. And once I got into that surgery room, it was on because then my family member, my wife, my two kids, they were little ones. They were just tiny. Isaac jumped on the bed. And man, I just wanted to cry right there because I felt like this would probably be the last time I see them. And I looked at them. I said, hey, guys, I love you kissed them all and I said I'll see you on the other side they just didn't know which other side I meant but in my heart I knew side of victory of I live or the side I'm in heaven but I win so my words were right on I'll see you on the other side and so now I'm at the doorway why do I share this with you because I believe in the name of Jesus that we're all at the doorway of a miracle we're all at the doorway of a breakthrough But do you perceive, do you perceive that once you get in the presence of God, your life can shift, your season can shift, everything can change, but we see with our natural and we keep saying it'll never happen. I'll never be that. I can never be a real follower of Jesus. I can never give my life to God. Why? Because we're so consumed and distracted with the spirit of this world and we don't change. When God has given us the greatest salvation on planet earth, it's his son, Jesus. I'm telling you. That no longer will we walk into church not perceiving that one word from heaven can shift my life. Today, one word, I'm at the doorway. You're at the doorway of your miracle. You're at the doorway of your way. You're at the doorway of whatever it is that you need God to do for your life. Stand to your feet. Quickly stand to your feet and say with me, I'm at the doorway. Come on. Listen, a little bit is much with God. 
a little bit as much with God. You may not be able to see it, but there's just a little bit of belief where you're saying, man, but as I hear this word, I can, I can, I can somewhat see that God can do this. I can't do this, but God can do this. I can't really see the fullness of it, but I can see a little glimpse. I can see that God is going to deliver me, set me free from this addiction, this slave of whatever it is that's been holding you bondage. I can see it in Jesus' name. It's not in your name. It's in his name. I want you to see it for a second. I want you to go ahead right now. You're at the doorway of your miracle. Come on, see it right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Every eye closed, see it. single one of us that today we would have that little bit of faith to know that you are the God who saves that you will hear our cry God Lord I thank you that this time next year say this time next year there's change happening I'm stepping into my healing I'm gonna see my miracle my children are coming back to God my family is getting strong my faith my trust my dependence is on almighty god i can see it i'll be stronger more trustworthy i'll be more faithful to the things of god to the kingdom of god in the name of jesus say it again in the name of jesus thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven this is my day that the Lord has made and I rejoice and I'm glad in it now give the Lord a big hand clap and just tell him I rejoice Lord this time next year I'm at the doorway in Jesus name amen